Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Extrospective Podcast with your host, Zach Villeneuve Snell. This week, I've got a special Christmas gift for you all with a two week free subscription to Runner. What is Runner? I hear you ask. Well, I've known one of the founders and head coach, Ben Parker, for around two years after connecting online. And he was actually on episode six of the podcast. And if you haven't checked it out, please go and do so. I highly recommend it. Super, super invaluable conversation. But I wanted to take this podcast to the next level and sponsorship with a brand that I truly believe in seemed to align well with the direction we're both headed in. Runner is the first of its kind, number one rated, fully automated running coaching service. And whether you're training for your first marathon, a faster 10K time, or simply couch to 5K, you'll be guided by an expert team, including Olympic marathon runner, Steph Davis. And using code ZAK, that's Z-A-K, you'll get your first two weeks free to see what all the hype is about. Thank you once again, if you're listening, for sponsoring the podcast, any of the team from Runner. I really appreciate it. And it's something that I really believe in. I've been pushing Runner to my friends and family since before I even considered having them as a sponsor on the podcast. So please do go and check it out if you're thinking about getting into running or taking your running to the next level. In this week's episode, I am joined by Darren Tunstall, who is a former actor, TEDx speaker, and senior lecturer at the Guildford School of Acting, where he currently leads the Masters program. In this episode, Darren gives us a detailed account of his upbringing, growing up working class and losing both his parents before the age of 15, before turning it all around and going to Cambridge University, embarking on a career in acting. Darren is best known for devising, performing and directing award-winning shows at the Royal Shakespeare Company and has worked for the BBC, ITV and Film 4. He even recites what it was like to work with the Chuckle Brothers, which is a personal favourite of mine. This podcast so far has been about unique and insightful generous stories and this one is no different as Darren takes us back to what it's like forging a career in acting and what he has learned along the way. Without further ado, Darren Tunstall. The people I've worked with, the things that I've done in my career, but people always want to know about that one. Film director Sam Mendes. I got to know him as a student at Cambridge. Because you haven't got a mum, you haven't got a dad. What are you actually going to do? It must have been a part of them. I thought, actually, he's sort of cool because he's this working class kid. It's as though I've been rewarded for what I've just been through. Because it was a vehicle for Rowan Atkinson, it would have made me a household name. Wow, Ben Elton just told me I have a lot of comedy in me. Now I seem to spend an awful lot of my time pondering about why we bother doing this in the first place. And I don't know what my authentic self is. I have a funny feeling that it might be the self that I present to you that gets your admiration. Because it mattered to you, you realise that it's possible to matter to others. So first of all, Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. You? I'm, I'm really good. I'm really, really good. So the reason why I've invited you onto the podcast today uh, is because... Of course, on the TEDx event that you were at this year, I was very privileged to be the host of that, and I really enjoyed your talk on how Thank actors you. gain gain the, the audience trust. And we'll delve into that a little bit later on, but I think it's something that's really important and can be applied not only to the acting world, but just generally speaking, when we're interacting with one another, uh, conducting yeah. ourselves with uh, with more smoothness. Um, First of all, I'll start off, we'll, we'll turn back the pages, as I always do in these episodes. Uh, you've described yourself as contradictory. Yeah, how would you inter- like to introduce yourself today? Um, how would I introduce myself? Uh, I guess w- what I meant by saying I'm contradictory is that uh, I think if you're, if you're looking at someone from the outside, you get a fix on them kind of quite in, in a way more easily than if you're thinking about yourself. I think it's easier to see someone from outside than it is to see yourself. And particularly, it's very hard to see yourself as other people see you, I think. It can be very, very difficult. It's it's, it's occupied my mind a lot because this is something that we do with actors. We try to hold the mirror up in front of them and say, look, this is how you come across. This is how people's, or at least how I see you or how other people might see you. And that becomes a a tool for you it becomes part of your toolkit that you understand that and you gain an awareness of how you come across to people so it it i i suppose by by virtue of the fact that i've spent such a lot of my, my adult life wondering about this uh, the deeper i go into it the more i realize I, I just seem to be like this bag of contradictions you know it just really depends on what happens today you know and um I've become quite suspicious of people who seem very sure of themselves, you know, that they'll come out with beliefs and opinions. And I go, yes, maybe in five minutes, you might modify that opinion 
depending on whether it starts raining or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think the kind of idea that, you know, and it's particularly kind of pertinent at the moment because there's so much um, narrative around identity at the moment that people say, what's my identity, you know, or what is my authentic self? Right. And uh, <laughs> it just makes me kind of go, right, who's up for a fight? <laughs> <Can I get this? laughs> because I, I don't know what people are talking about half the time, you know. And uh, I want to say, well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what my authentic self is. I have a funny feeling that it might be the self that I present to you that gets your admiration. Right. <laughs> your okay. approval. And I go, great, that's me. That's really you. After all, I'm not likely to kind of go around, if I went around and did something really awful, you know, I'm much more likely to say, well, that's just not like me. I mean, I'm just not like that. You're not going to go around and say, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm like all the time. I go around being really violent and unpleasant to people. People don't say that, do they? They never say that. Sure. You know? What they actually say is when they get approval for things, that, that's like, yeah, that's so me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not something that you can kind of um, separate from your relationship to the group that you belong to or the groups that you belong to. You're wedded to them. Um, and over the years, I've become more and more and more aware of the extent to which I'm a social animal, as we all are, and that I anything that I say about myself is likely to be open to contradiction as soon as you place me in a context. Um, how do I introduce myself? Well, I'm, I would like to say that I'm a, a sort of working class kid from the northeast of England who made good, if you like. And uh, it's quite a patronising way of putting it to say I made good, because of course, you know, that's a definition of making good, you know, that some people may not agree with. But um, I moved out of my background, you know, uh, I came south, I got myself a posh education and I started to pursue an artistic career and became a more sort of middle class person. And so I have these two <laughs> people in me, one of whom pulls me back <laughs> to my roots, you know, and says, come on, get your feet back on the ground, be real, be pragmatic, be sensible, you know, be, you, you know what I mean? Remember what reality is. And then this other sort of more idealistic middle class person, right, who thinks, well, you can achieve anything, you can do anything, be anything, you know. <laughs> and they just have, uh, they have this constant war with each other inside of me, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. And that's what, that's the personality that you are now that comes at doing uh, your, yeah. your lecturing and your, and your teaching. Yeah, and your, it does, and your research. Yeah. I mean, people who are, if I want to have students who are from the North, in the northeast um and then i start chatting to them i may get to know, start getting to know them as i've been doing recently with my new ma cohort some of them from the northeast some of them really not from from not very far away from where i was born and brought up and they say yes i can hear it i, I can hear that you're you know and other people might not necessarily pick up on that um but they they do they go yeah i can sort of see the northerner in you even though you've lost your kind of northeast durham interesting voice okay. accent you know so, so if we turn back the pages then to to your childhood um firstly what, what was it like and how were you as a child how would you describe yourself yeah i was born in 1965 um in august 1965 so you know the beatles had released help <laughs> that far back <laughs> Uh, which just seems like eons ago now, doesn't it? It really does seem like another world altogether. And I was born in a uh, uh, in a council house in Darlington. Um, and we were quite a big family. There were four kids, you know, and there was my mum and dad and my, my nan used to live with us as well, I think. I think. But I have a very, very dodgy, shaky memory uh, about my childhood. Um, and then I think when I was about five years old, we, mum and dad had, had managed to save up some money and get a house. Uh, it was like this pokey little terraced house um, in Darlington and uh, with a backyard, like something out of Coronation Street. Mm -hmm. And um, that I didn't like that because the council house was bigger and there was a garden and there was space. They felt like there was a sort of, and it was something that I had much more, I felt much more happy there in my mind, I, you know, in my memory of it, I mean, I should say. 
we moved to this house i didn't like it as much anything but you know we all felt a bit squashed together sharing bedrooms you know and what have you uh like that and then i went to, to primary school there and then a series of um sort of tragic things happened to me from the age of about 10 up to the age of about 15. i lost several members of my family and uh, i think that was the sort of the most important thing that's ever happened to me apart from getting married and having a baby because it formed my outlook on life uh my fir first of all my brother died my brother was in the navy and uh, he was killed in a motorbike accident um, when he was on shore leave in the bahamas and then not just a, just a month or two later after that my mother died basically of grief and i was about 10 so it was just this kind of avalanche of disaster that hit the family um and uh my father hung on in there with just the most immense sort of guts to just keep going you know in spite of that what must have been unbearable kind of grief that he was living through um, and he survived another five years before he gave up the ghost um, himself so I had these family disasters happen and at the same and it felt like every year someone else was dying like my nana then went as well you know before my father died my nana had gone it felt like we were just losing people all the time and so I had a really difficult time you know I went to a comprehensive school which I didn't like you know, it was tough. There were fights every day. There was this sort of pecking order that, you know, and you had, and as a boy, you had to, you had sort of had to have fights in order to maintain, it, it was like baboons or something, you know, uh, <laughs> like maintaining your status in the, the hierarchy. You just have to keep, keep having fights in order to kind of keep your position in the higher, you know, and there was constant bully, I mean, endless bullying, you know. Every day someone would be picking on you or, you know, with that. So every day it felt like I was going into a war zone. Whenever I went to school, I was dealing with all this sort of misery in my head as well. Uh, and I didn't know what I was or what, you know, all I really knew was that I, I was sort of angry and I didn't really know what to do with this anger. Now, at that time, now I'm talking now about 1977, 76, 77, 78. Then that was the rise of punk rock music, 1976, 77. So I was 11, 12 um, at this time, before my father had died, my mother had died, and I'd gone to, I went into comp school, and I sort of got into that and became a sort of punk because it was a badge that I could wear, which sort of channeled ideas for me that kind of expressed my anger for me. It expressed my, you know, boys strapping on their guitars and playing very loud three chords <laughs> in their garage, you know, and shouting. <laughs> Just kind of encapsulated how I, felt, how I felt, right? So I kind of got into it um, and that became my little tribe as well, you know. Uh, my sister used to take me to a disco, which was, we, so we'd get on a bus on a Friday. My sister, two years older than me, and she would, we would get on the bus and we would go to this little place called Newton Acliffe down the road, where there was this little room where they had this disco on a Friday night. Um, and it was away from Darlington, it was away from people. And these were, and we were the, the sort of exotic creatures from Darlington, you know, uh, who turned up to this disco. And I would just dance my head off, you know, when they played the punk rock records and bring my own vinyl in and say, play this, play this. And sometimes they would look at it and go, I'm not playing that. It's like absolutely disgusting. Look at it. You know, just look at the cover, you know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I found a little sort of tribe. So for a while, there was, that was a good thing, actually, that was happening. There was still bullying and nastiness and everything, but there was an outlet for my rage. So that went on for a while. And, and the other thing that was good about that was that I ended up kind of being quite interesting to girls, to some girls at this place, because I was from the outside, you know, so I was kind of interesting. Um, so I kind of discovered girls and got excited about that. And then um, my father died and then I had a sort of epiphany, if you might say, at that point, where literally I remember very, very, very well the day that my father died, the day that 
that I was told this and then I phoned the school and told them and said, can I have the afternoon off? You know, <laughs> um, they said, of course, of course, you know, don't be silly. Um, and so, uh, and then somebody from school, a kid from school called Martin, who I still follow on Facebook, and he came round to see me because he was one of the more sensible kids. He came over, so they'd sent him round to see me. You know, it was really, in retrospect, I think that was just such a touching thing to do. You know, they sent one of my mates round, you know, uh, and he came and said hello. And we went out to the park and sat there and he said, what are you going to do? You know, and I thought, what a, later I thought, what a brilliant question to have asked me. He just, this so simple, you know, but what are you going to do, you know? Because you haven't got a mum, you haven't got a dad now. You know, what are you actually going to do? And so he just sort of laid it down in a really simple way, you know. I don't think he was being consciously wise, but it just hit me. Actually, I have to do something. I, you know, I, I can't continue. That's not a, that's no longer an option. So I kind of had that epiphany moment where I thought, well, I think I need to change myself. I think I need to sort of get over myself now and start to look and build something that could be described as a future. So I, st I had another two years of difficulty, uh, but I went to college. My, my other sister, my oldest sister, continued to look after me, for which I'm eternally grateful. And we lived in the house, you know, and there was one time when there were seven of us in that house and now there were two. And um, so she would go, look, I'll give you a bit of pocket money. You can go to college. You know, you don't have to go and work, right, and earn a job. I'll, I've got a job, so I'll take care of you and be your mom. Um, but, you know, the trade-off is you, you've got to knuckle down and, you know, don't be a bad lad. Stop being a bad lad. Because I've been in trouble with the police a couple of times and things. And that was it. That sort of, I thought, she's right. People are right about this. I've got to do something about this, you know. Um, so that's what I did. And it, it was difficult. You know, I would go out on a Friday and get absolutely hammered with my mates, you know, and throw up everywhere and things. And I was trying to, I was still trying to find an outlet for, for these feelings that I had, you know, these negative feelings that I had. But I now had a sort of mission in my head. And so I went to college and I studied English, which was the only thing that I had been sort of in my own mind, the only thing I'd been sort of even vaguely good at at school. And I met a couple of teachers, you know, and I was very lucky to meet them. I had a teacher who was a sort of social science, sociology kind of teacher, and she was the first feminist I ever met. <laughs> In my life. She was 1981, you know, she was a 1981 feminist. This was yeah. not green and common, you know. <laughs> and uh, she was absolutely in my face every day, you know, with stuff like my attitudes and this, that, and this, and that. You're not even thinking, you know, and all this. And she was absolutely on me all the time, no prisoners. And she knew exactly what she was doing. She was educating me, you know, she was growing me up. You know, she was saying, you've got to stop thinking about who, what's happened to you and who you were, you know, because that's not a solution to your life. The solution to your life is to start manning up. So she was sort of throwing the gauntlet down at me all the time because she cared. And there was another teacher who was an equally extraordinary man called David. And he was and he taught me theatre studies. It was the first time I'd ever really taken any sort of interest in theatre. It was part of the thing that I was doing, the sort of overall course that I was doing. I went to a college of technology, which no longer exists in Darlington. And I did it partly to get away from schoolmates who went to the other college, the sixth form. I just thought, I've just got to get into a different place. So I went away from them and I thought, well, I'll maybe be like a journalist um, because my brother-in-law, my eldest sister's fella, was a journalist, you know, he, he worked as a sports journalist on local papers and things. So I thought, well, if you're good at English, that's what you do. So I'll do a sort of journalisty thing. I'll do English and I'll, you know, I'll become like a journalist. But I met this guy and he was like, I don't know if you ever remember, there was a guy called, there was a thing called the Naked Civil Servant a long time ago. And it was a, it was a very unique story. It was a, it was a memoir by a man called Quentin Crisp. And he was this flamboyant homosexual at a time when there weren't any public homosexuals, you know, when it was absolutely taboo 
still. Uh, and he he put it out there and he was very open about it. And he was very, very obviously camp uh, and wi incredibly witty man. And he, he's quite a brave man, really. And uh, my teacher was a bit like him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he would wear these cravats and scarves, and you know, and he had this shock of white hair. And he'd be, oh, oh, like this, you know, with his yes, yeah, yeah. red, you know. And... <laughs> The behaviour was sort of such a peacocky kind of behaviour, it astonished me. But underneath, he really cared. And these two people really cared about me. They became more than just teachers. They became mentors and they became my friends as well. They would, I would meet them sometimes at weekends. They would take me to museums and show me things, you know, and educate me. Because I think they could see there was something in me. And I'm so grateful to them. Because if they hadn't been there, it might, you know, well, my life would have taken a very different course um, than it did. And he got me interested in theatre. So that was uh, that. So I, I just got my head down. And then one day when I was 17 or so, a letter arrived in this college from a Cambridge University college called St. Catherine's College. This letter out of the blue arrived. And um, my friend David, he showed it to me and he said, we've got this letter. Uh, and Mrs. Thatcher, who was the prime minister, was pushing through this educational initiative at that time for state school kids to break down the door. You know, talented state school kids have got to get into the posh. You know, we've got to stop this, this kind of arcane system because she was a sort of populist Tory in some ways, Mrs. Thatcher, you know. She wasn't an aristocratic Tory. She was the son of a shopkeeper, a daughter of a shopkeeper in from Grantham. So she had that kind of lower middle class achievement mentality. Uh, and it just landed on his, and he said, you could try for this. And I, this is like another world to me, you know, and I, I barely even heard of these places. Nobody around me was showing any interest. None of my colleagues, none of my student colleagues really were showing anything remotely resembling an interest in that sort of thing. But he said, and I said, well, I don't know what to do, you know. So he said, well, we'll find somebody. And he found this old man in Darlington who used to, go, who had gone to Cambridge like years ago. <laughs> and I, visited, I visited him a few times and he kind of sat with me in a copy of Macbeth and tried to explain a bit about it, you know, and I was kind of... Okay, but I basically, I just read books and I, I discovered that that was what I had to do. I just had to read and just never stop. So I would go home, do my homework, read, endless, just read, read, read. And, and David and, and one or two other teachers who were prepared to help said, you need to know about this guy. He's called Plato. Read this. And I would read it and I would go, what the hell is this? You know, and then they would go, did you read it? You know, right, good. Here's Karl Popper. <laughs> Uh, this fella criticised him, <laughs> read it, <laughs> we would do, you know, and they were giving me this crash course in, uh, you know, what public school kids will know that you don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> that was what it was all about. Like, you don't know this stuff because they don't teach you, but the public school kids do. So we're going to tell you what it is and show you what it is. Um, and that's your that's your weapon, you know. And so I sat the Cambridge exam and I passed. And uh, I a, a couple of days before Christmas in 1982, the phone rang when I was at home with my sister Karen. And it was Dr. Barron from St. Catherine's College. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Professor Barron. And he said, you, you are an exhibitioner. He said, you are an exhibitioner. And I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't, and I was so embarrassed that I didn't know. I didn't ask him. I, I didn't, I literally didn't know what he meant. Um, but I said, thank, thank you, thank you very much. And he said, yeah, we'll see you next year. And uh, we'll see, you know, there'll be something in the post soon. And that was the end of the conversation. And I told my sister and she said, well, I suppose we better drink some wine or something. <laughs> None of us knew what it was. <laughs> yeah. I had to find out later what it actually meant was it was sort of one step down from a scholar, you know. So I hadn't received the scholarship, but I'd received the one just below, uh, which was an exhibitioner. So that was that, and I was off to Cambridge. Wow. No, Sounds like an incredible, incredibly challenging, but I suppose so fulfilling and rewarding in the way that it taught you those lessons. Like, that's just, 
such an invaluable story and I'm just trying to remember all of that. It's just a complete different world, isn't it? Going back then to, I'd imagine the, the phone rang on the wall and you picked it up and that's how you got into university rather than all of this online portal stuff that we have now. And yeah, what, yeah. what a whirlwind, what a journey as well. That's, <laughs> that's so incredible. Um, and so what was Cambridge University like? I mean, that must have been um, such a contrast between um, yeah, the school you were well, at. Well, to begin with, it was terrifying. And I thought, you know, I had massive imposter syndrome where I thought, so, no, there must be somebody else called Darren, who you mean? It can't possibly be me. You must, you must have got the wrong name, the wrong person, you know, with the same name. But then I found some people who like, appeared to like me and get on with me. And I found some theatre people and uh, I made friends with them. And they, I think, I don't know what they thought of me. I suppose there must have been a part of them that thought, actually, he's sort of cool because he's this working class kid you know, and he wears really crap clothes. Because <laughs> uh, I, I bought clothes from, you know, a place called Millet's, uh, which was, you know, some, and, and I would buy, you know, I'd go to Oxfam for my jackets. Um, it's, it's all I could afford, you know. The, I think they saw it, you know, as a bit of a sort of thing. And so, they thought, oh, well, he's obviously, he's sort of quite interesting. He must be quite bright, you know, and all those sort of things must have gone on in people's minds, you know. Um, and then I got into the theatre thing and it just turned out that I had a bit of a knack for it. I auditioned and I got into the, some of the big stuff that was going on with the, with the kind of hot, the hot people who were there, you know, the exciting people were there who were sort of interested in me, I suppose, because I was a bit different. And I had that kind of anger. I mean, I, was, I, I, don't, I didn't go around spraying it all over the place in public, but in the acting, I think I was quite good at tapping into that rage you know that sort of male teenage male rage and so it gave me I guess it must have given me a sort of energy in people's eyes you know that was kind of quite interesting for them so I got into that and so uh, as soon as as soon as I got over my terror and everything and I began to realize that they weren't going to kick me out that I was going to be all right uh, and that actually my tutor liked me and thought I was interesting, thought I had interesting things to say and all that, you know, and I had good supervisions and I was quite inspired by what I was reading and by what this tutor and people were giving me. Um, once I got over that, I, I realised that I'd been let loose in the sweet shop, right? Because that's how it felt in 1983, 84, uh, at that, in that place at that time. I, I, I mean, for someone like me, it felt like I'd been allowed into the sweet shop, and I could sort of do as I pleased and much of the time. I could, you know, if I wanted to spend the day in the pub, I could. If I wanted to, you know, sit sit there and just read Proust all day, I could. You know, as long as I showed up for my supervisions a couple of times a week, you know, went to the odd lecture, wrote the essays that I was asked to write, you know, everything else was up to me. For the first time, I suppose. The For university the first line. time, you know? And so suddenly I sort of thought, wow, it's as though I've been rewarded for what I've just been through. Mm. You know? For the sort of 10, best part of 10 years of my life where I had been battling, I felt like every day was a war, you know? Now, suddenly it felt like I'd got my present, you know? And my present was to be in the most beautiful city you know, with beautiful colleges and beautiful people and <laughs> very intelligent, you know, posh people <laughs> who uh, 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 were endlessly uh, charming to me. Uh, and saw something in you. And saw, saw something, something special. in me and sort of went, yeah, you're fine. You can be with us. You can be part of our gang. You know, please do. And would give me status as well uh, as I went through those three years. I gained status through my um, through 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 theatre. You know, I became I became somebody who directed things, and people looked to me and went, "Oh, you know, actually, you you seem a bit weirdly. You seem sort of more confident about what you're doing." You know, but what was I? I guess what I was doing was I had a perspective. You know, I could compare it to something which was a thousand times worse. Right. So I'd go, I don't really see why I shouldn't have a sense of pleasure and confidence in this compared to what I've actually had to do to get here in the first place, you know, mm. Mm. what and I've that's actually, actually lived through, you know. Absolutely. And that's actually 
uh, a parallel theme that I've picked up on um, from a, a few of these episodes where right. um, a friend of mine, David, who's, who's a founder and co-chair at Social Mobility, I think it's the network in, in KPMG. Um, right. he, he came from a rural working class background in Scotland and has elevated himself to a very, very successful stage in his career now in his mid twenties. And it's really interesting to, to hear that gratitude complex, I suppose yeah, you'd call much. it, you know, it yeah. gives you the, the light and shade and the, the perspective. Yeah. And, and it gives me something else as well, I think, which is a kind of stoicism um, about life. You know, I see, I mean, if I was to say I have a tragic view of life, I don't mean that in a negative, bad way. I mean, I have a realism about life. I have a, um, I understand that there's no such thing as a free lunch in life and that everything is a trade-off. Um, you know, and that's what I mean by a kind of tragic vision, tragic view of life is that there is no utopia. There is just trade-offs mm. and some trade-offs are better than others. But for every wonderful thing, there is a cost. You know, everything, nothing comes without some cost somewhere. And I don't mean that that's a bad thing. I mean that that is a human thing. And the bad thing is if you deny it. For me, the bad thing is sure. if you pretend that is not true, because what you're going to end up doing is offloading those costs onto someone else, mm -hmm. you know, rather than taking the responsibility onto your own shoulders and going, no, am I willing to to pay the cost for that or not? Do you know what I mean? Rather than, hey, I can I can do as I please, be who I please, have anything I want, blah blah blah, and someone else down the road will pick up the tab for your behavior yes it's like that's what i mean by a tragic view mm -hmm. um, of life yeah and it's almost like that the innate state of life is like there's suffering all around us at some point that each of us will experience and yes you, you yes. need that yes meaning and purpose to kind of alleviate that but it's yes. you can't just have happiness and bliss right like in like you're saying that's, a, that's a that's a fantasy for, mm -hmm. for for me that's just a fantasy you know and it might be a sustaining fantasy for some people and i i so i don't necessarily want to pull the plug on them <laughs> but i know for myself that's not the lesson that my own life taught me sure. shall, we, shall we say shall we say makes makes perfect sense i think it's it's worth considering anyway uh, for, for people listening yes. I mean, Nietzsche said, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger, right? That's not true for everybody all the time. <laughs> right. right. I suppose can be used to, to make right. you stronger with the right perspective, yeah. potentially. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, so incredible contrast moving into Cambridge. Yeah. And you almost mar marveled as this outsider kid who had yeah. a little bit of a quirk and confidence to yeah. him and yeah. was able to pursue those roles into being directors and uh, and, and acting and in the way stuff. that you did. No, I wrote right. plays and things as well. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. you graduated, and then yeah, and um, there was a there was a lad there called Dale who was just a year above me at university, and and he'd done plays with me and things, and I I, I really liked him, I admired him, and he went off to train at Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, and he came back with the news that it was good. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> so and then he kind of I remember sort of having a chat with him and he, and he said to me you should try for there and in my naivety I thought oh okay Dale said <laughs> you, you know I mean one looks for answers right <laughs> um, and so uh, and so I thought well I'm I'm interested in becoming in joining the theatre and becoming an actor you know people tell me that I'm good at it that you know they like me when I'm doing it um, and I can't quite see myself being a journalist anymore, you know, if I was going to be a journalist, I would have started writing for the local newspaper, you know, student newspapers, but I haven't been, I haven't done that. What have I been doing? You know, well, I've been in plays is what I've been doing. Um, so I thought, well, maybe this is what I'm cut out to do. So I went and did the rounds of the drama schools, did the auditions for the drama schools. And lo and behold, Bristol Ovic offered me a place. And uh, maybe Dale had a quiet word with them, who knows? <laughs> uh, uh, and I sort of found the place really fascinating. It was like a, a in Clifton in Bristol, it's like this little house, you know, little old house on the hill near the Clifton Suspension Bridge. 
Um, so really picturesque little place and just very, very different again to, to university, you know, to the kind of smorgasbord of university. It was seemed like quite a focused little place. Anyway, uh, um, I, I, they said, do you want to come here? And they, uh, they made me go for two years. I only wanted to go for one year, uh, but uh, they made me go for two years. And in those days, of course, one had grants. So I had had three years of funding for my university. And then I got another year from Durham uh, County Council to do a post-grad thing at Bristol. And then the second year was basically my father's insurance that was the money from my father's in death, which I had saved in a building society account. And that financed my second year mostly. Uh, I have to confess I had already spent a fair bit of it at university <laughs> on alcohol, <laughs> trying to keep up with the posh kids. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, and their expensive taste. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but but uh, so I did that and I went to Bristol and I trained as an actor at Bristol. And so it was another, yet again, another complete chapter in, in in my life you know where suddenly I was within a very small group of people only about 100 people there in this house you know a small group of tutors who one saw every day went in there start at half past eight in the morning doing your warm-ups in there doing physical stuff and vocal stuff all day putting yourself in front of people and performing and being criticized and told this that and the other you know uh, going home at seven o'clock, exhausted with not very much money, you know, having a bag of chips and going to sleep, start again next day, you know. Uh, but it felt like I was on some kind of trajectory now. And I thought, well, this seems to be, they've chosen me, you know, and there were, God knows, you know, 15, 1600 people, 2000 people tried to get in, you know. Um, so obviously they thought it was worth giving me a place. So I seemed like that's what, God wanted me to do. So that's what I was doing. There were, again, there were a couple of teachers there who I found I gravitated towards, you know, sort of old gurus. And there was this extraordinary German Jewish fella called Rudy Shelley, um, who was, I think he was about 70 odd when I went, you know. So he was starting to kind of lose it a bit sometimes. <laughs> like he would start a, a class and you would go, oh, Rudy, we've done this one. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he would, but he was a he was a really nice bloke actually, and he taught me taught us a few things, you know, like stuff that you don't read in books, you know, trade secrets. It's that that has stuck with me. I still pass those things on to my students. Um, they stuck with me. So once again, I had that sort of feeling that I was in a good place at a good moment. You know, the, like you talk about the grat gratitude. I th at the time, I didn't always show it, I think, to him. But in retrospect, many of the things that him and, and a couple of other the tutors there made us do or made us think about or told us to do landed with me. They landed with me later. And I thought they were right, actually. That's right. And now bitter experience has taught me the value of what was said to me. And so from now on, mm, I'm going to do that. So I had two years uh, and I left... Um, uh, and uh, started to become an, uh, uh, in 1988. I became an actor, and that's what. Um, firstly, I mean, just to just to recap that, I think that must have been interesting for the neighbours, right? Like out in the hills, making all those noises, and the other yes. thing that's yeah, sometimes outdoors on the hills, right? Outdoors, okay, just in the summer you go outside people. and shout yeah. you know, speeches from King Lear, you know, yeah, <laughs> to the wind. I think the the and the interesting thing to me as well, and it's things that I've heard from members potentially I've been friends with who have been in, in GSA is how competitive it can be because everyone is everyone knows that there is a finite number of like roles within the acting world and because especially at that um, post-grad school everyone is exceptionally good at what they do so it must have been yeah, a really yeah. like if you use it to your to the advantage it can be a really empowering experience because everyone's pushing each other to become better and yeah, better and better they were there was definite competition there was especially male competition you know and as a psychologist you you would know what i'm talking about you know sure um male to male c competitiveness especially when there are females in the room yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> it goes up 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had a best mate there, two really, really good mates, uh, you know, and I and we shared a flat together in Clifton. And we were also in competition with each other. You know, we were, we were, we, we had wonderful banter and we had great times. And we were also up for the same stuff. You know, we were out for the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and but there was a prize at the end of the year for, you know, the best male student, best female student. And uh, the prize was a job and an equity card. So it was a valid, valuable little prize. It was a job at the Bristol Vic Theatre, basically. You got a contract at the Bristol Vic Theatre and your wages were paid for by a local estate agent. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so they got some publicity out of it. You know, you were the Chesterton Lalonde student of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, me and my best mate went up for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I got it. And funnily enough, he, um, I just, I, I just assumed that he would walk away with it. I had assumed that I wouldn't stand a chance because I, I had such, admiration for him. I thought he was such a fantastic actor. So once again, I was taking my surprise. So I ended up, my first job was at Bristol Lovic Theatre. Um, and I did three shows there, two of which were sort of okay. Uh, one of which was absolutely fantastic. And one of the best things I ever did. So I, I've got very fond memories of that time of being working in that theatre. You know, it's beautiful Georgian theatre, you know, dedicated audience, local audience who loved going there and everyone had fun. I mean, it was just massive amounts of fun. You worked, you know, I worked hard. I, I, I wanted to prove myself. So I was, you know, I was very, very conscientious about my work. But I also played hard. Uh, so after the show, I would go next door. There's a little wine bar, you know, called Renato's, where all the actors would go. I would go there. That's where my sex life happened. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd drink myself happily till half past two and go to bed. <laughs> Right. And live, live hard. You know, I lived hard um, and spent all my wages. But um, I, I was on the way. I was an actor now, you know, and I got confirmation because I got a pay packet. Mm -hmm. yeah, as I was. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's incredible. I, I think one of the questions I was going to ask you is how was the process of the early years sustaining yourself, making a name for yourself? But it, it sounds as if very initially because of your hard work during the postdoctorate or not post -doctorate, the, the post postgrad, because you then were able to go straight into working at that at that place, it wasn't yeah. like you were spat out the other side on your own no, trying to fend for yourself and get no, contracts. I wasn't. And there were some who were, you know, including from Bristol, there was one or two who were, and that was hard for them. Uh, yeah, I was lucky. I landed on my feet with that job, and I had a sort of like a couple of years of honeymoon period, you might say. When I was at Cambridge, um, one of the students um, who, I was actually a little bit above him, I think I was a year above him, was Sam Mendes, the film director, Sam Mendes. Um, and I got to know him as a student at Cambridge, you know, and he was directing plays and things, and he was highly competent at that time already, you know, very, very confident young man. I mean, supremely confident and, and very good, you know, very capable. And, uh, and ple you know, he was he was very pleasant as well. I found him very pleasant human being to sort of socialise with. Um, <clears throat> and I did a few things with him and he remembered me. Uh, he, he he had a, a stroke of good fortune himself. He was working as an uh, assistant director at Chichester Festival Theatre. And then they had ha decided to build a studio, a big studio called the Minerva, which was this beautiful new theatre building. In, this was in about 1989-90. They built this thing and uh, he was put in charge of it by the director, the overall director of the theatre, the artistic director. So he was now in charge of this brand spanking new studio that everybody was talking about, everybody was excited about. And he programmed the, the season, the first season over the summer. You know, fantastic, absolutely fantastic for him. But it... He, he's a capable pair of hands, you know, he, he was a good choice. Um, and he phoned me up uh, when I was working at Bristol and he said, do you want to come and be part of the company? So he'd been sort of keeping an eye on some people that he'd known from student days and he wanted some allies, I think, as well, you know, some people to sort of support him. 
And so there were one or two of us from the old sort of Cambridge University set who joined him there. And I had this amazing summer working at this new theatre. So I went from Bristol to Chichester and I'd done basically a year of of not of, of full on work, you know, lots of plays. And, and then I got a television job after that, a children's BBC job. So it felt like I was on a bit of a roll for two and a half years. I felt like I was on a roll. And then that moment happened when suddenly there was a new generation of students leaving drama school and they were the next lot to have their Indian summer. And suddenly I was not quite so fascinating to the world as I had been a year before. So I did, then I, that was when I experienced it and I, I moved to London uh, to, and, and lived with some friends in South London and suddenly discovered unemployment. Um, and I was unemployed for a little while, but the voice of my father was always in my head. And my father was a very proud working class man who never not worked, you know. He, uh, he worked for 30 odd years in, uh, the, in a factory in Darlington, the, uh, wire mills. He was an inspector of the quality of wire, you know, wire mills for 30 odd years. And then one day he was redundant, just like that. And he didn't mope, you know, he just dusted himself off and got a job. And he, he just took the job that was going, you know. He was a, he was a janitor for a while. And then he got, but he took the job, you know, he goes, I'm just doing this. And there was no fuss about it. He just did it. Um, and then he found another job at another factory as a quality, quality inspector. So he got back into what he, his skill set, if you like. Um, and he died in that job. But um, I'd learned from him not, you know, that sort of stubborn feeling of not taking handouts, you know, that, I, I do believe that you have to have a safety net and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not ruthless about it. I think people need safety nets. There are people who need these safety nets and there are some people who maybe don't. And I felt like I was one of those people that it wouldn't, I felt it's not right for me to be doing this when I could be working. You know. Do you mean with like taking like government handouts? Yeah, government money from the taxpayer. Mm. Um, and that that money is set aside for people who have no other option available to them, you know, so they don't starve. That was my thinking about it, you know. It's not set aside for people like me who are fit and healthy and well enough to do a day's work, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did it for a little while and then I thought, I don't like it. I really don't like it. I don't like myself going to the unemployment office and things I don't like it so I stopped and I thought from now on I'm working and so I would just do whatever job I could get my hands on you know and I would just do stuff in London I did lots of different jobs and then an acting job would come along and so uh, yeah uh, and that was the last time I, I ever got anywhere near an unemployment benefits office you know that like when was that 1992 or something 91 oh, okay. the last time I ever went anywhere near one and, and uh, uh, with that because I can, you know, because, I, because I'm capable of it. So I, I don't feel right about taking money that should be for someone who needs it more than me. So anyway, that's, uh, that was that. So I did have that little dip. And then the next thing that came along was there was, um, now we're in the sort of beginnings of the John Major in, towards Tony Blair era. <laughs> and I, I hit a sort of wall as an actor where it was about four years or so into my career and the the part i was getting work but it wasn't great um and it, i felt well i could just blame my agent or it could be that something's not right and i did a show at uh, the watermill in newbury i did the wizard of oz um, and i was playing the lion in the wizard of oz which really, on, on paper, actually, the line's probably the best part in the show. It's the most sort of the most loved character in many ways and uh, all of that. So there was absolutely no reason at all why I shouldn't have had a ball doing this part. But I was quite unhappy. I didn't feel like I was any good at it. And, you know, it just didn't feel good to do. And I thought something's really wrong. And my girlfriend at the time came to see it. And uh, absolutely so grateful to her because she told me the truth. You know, she said, y you just looked really miserable. 
what is that? And she just berated me, you know, she said, what's the matter with you? You know, like this. And I, th and I got a reality check, you know, in this moment from her, uh, for which I'm so grateful. And I thought she's right. I, there's no good being like this. I, I've got to be, you know, I've got to deal with this better than I am. The fact that I sort of feel like I've hit a brick wall in my career, you know, stop being indulgent, do something about it. So I did. Uh, and I asked around and some friends said, well, you know, there's some new stuff kind of happening at the moment. Uh, there's this company called Theatre de Complicité. And they all went to this school, this mysterious Paris called the Ecole Jacques Lecoq School, the Lecoq School. Uh, and they all do this thing. They, I think they call it physical theatre or something. <laughs> No one had a, no one knew anything about it, you know. And uh, anyway, they were on and they had shows on and they had shows on at the National Theatre. So they were starting to really make a name for themselves as a company. They had this show on called Street of Crocodiles, which was based upon a book by Bruno Schulz, the Polish writer, modernist writer Bruno Schulz. And I went along to see it. And I, there was a bit of the show I didn't really like. There was something about the show I thought, I don't really get this. You know, um, I don't quite understand what, what they do, what's going on. But I saw a bunch of actors who could do stuff that I couldn't do. They could move in ways that I couldn't move. Oh, they could what move. was it specifically? Well, they were, they were using a very stylized kind of way of performing, if you like. Um, but acrobatically, for one thing, I mean, the first image of the show was a man walking up a wall. Um, that was the first thing you saw. There's a man called Clive Mendes, uh, who was literally walking up a wall like this, you know. And it was a startling opening image uh, anyway, like a circus act. But he was a character with a costume on. So there were lots of little things like this where you saw things and you were very, very surprised at how that had, something had been achieved. Um, and they worked as a team, you know, with this amazing choreographic fluidity, as if they all seemed to be reading each other's minds you know, all the time. And they, the way they were interacting with each other. And I thought, I can't do, I couldn't do that. I don't know what that is. So I became fascinated by that. And it just so happened that at that time I had uh, done a couple of television adverts. So I made some money from some, uh, from some, from royalties off that, you know, repeat fees as they call them. And so for the first time in my life, I had been able to clear a bunch of debts that, that had accrued, you know, um, be, by virtue of the fact that I didn't work very often or, or very, very lucratively, I was able to clear some debts and I had a bit of spare money. And so my friend said, well, maybe you should spend this money on kind of retraining or something, you know, kind of taking a different direction for a while and seeing, seeing what that's like. So that's what I did. And in 1992, um, I spent six months to a year doing the kind of training that is associated with that field. So I discovered how to be be better with my own body, how to be in my own body in a way. And th that work usually involves devising and improvising and creating things from scratch. And so I came to know a new group of people that we, you know, I was going and training with them and we were coming to know each other and going through these quite vulnerable situations together where we were standing up in front of some teacher or some guru person doing improvising spontaneous stuff and being shot down in flames and then going again and trying again you know and going gosh we were in this together you know but we were learning stuff big stuff when you come out of a british drama school kind of conventional british drama school you kind of think well now i'm ready to join the theater and be a part of the theater and what have you and you came out of that place in France and you thought, well, I am the theatre. I don't, I'm not waiting for anything. I'm just going to start. And so that's what you do. You start making work and you don't worry about, you know, anything else. You just make stuff and then you try and get somebody to house it for you. And that's what you do. And that's what we did. So we would make shows, you know, and I worked with some amazing talent, really talented people. We made shows together and we put them on the road and went, in vans to these little venues and things. So it really felt like you owned the work. It belonged to you. You'd made it mm. rather than, you know, you joined something that was sort of prefabricated. Um, you didn't get paid as much, but you loved what you did, you know, and it was, and you learned a lot because you were putting yourself out there in a, in a, in a different sort of a way to being in a conventional play. 
And I did that for several years. Some of those people became lifelong friends. Worked, I've worked with them a lot, doing different things over the years. But I, at the back of my mind, there was one other thing which had never quite fallen into place, which was when I was about 17, I think it was, I was taken on a trip to Stratford-on-Avon to the Royal Shakespeare Theatre uh, to see Derek Jacobi in, in Much Ado About Nothing. And I think this was by my mentors, <laughs> you know, my old sociology teacher, and I think they took me there. And I remember this, and they said, what do you think of this place? You know, and I sort of said, well, oh, it would be all right, wouldn't it, to kind of live here or work here, and this would be nice, you know, it's amazing. And uh, my wife reminded me of this, because I then got into the RSC. Uh, I got, I, I got, a, I auditioned, it was, I took, I had four auditions to get into the RSC before they finally took me, four times, knocking on the door. Um, and the reason why I got in was because I could be funny because I'd learned how to be funny by doing clowning and things with uh, this uh, and, and this so-called physical theatre bandwagon, this kind of revolution in British theatre, uh, self-identified sort of revolution, um, which had taken, taken hold during the kind of cool Britannia years of the mid nineties. Um, that then helped me because the mainstream theatres were now looking at these actors in a different way and going, actually, they bring something different to the table. You know, they've got great physical skills. They have a sort of common touch often. You know, they can really entertain the audience or, you know, and they just have a really good theatrical nous because that's sort of what you were learning. So they took me, you know, as the sort of funny one in The Merchant of Venice. <laughs> so you can be the funny one in a play where there is a notorious character who is notoriously unfunny. Go on then, make us laugh. And uh, sure enough, I did. Uh, and it went well. So yeah, so the next big event really in my life was the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I joined that company, worked with them for a number of years off and on, became a sort of company member and worked my way through the ranks of it. Uh, so I ended up doing a bit of movement work for them, as well as being in shows. I was in a big, big, successful Christmas show, which of Beauty and the Beast, um, which was one of their biggest shows they'd ever done. And I ended up being an associate director on that show because I knew the show really well. You know, so I was sort of getting, people were coming to know me at the RSC and I, and I loved working there. It was a joy to work there. So it was an absolute pleasure um, all the time. You know, wonderful family. Was, it, was that the late 90s? So that was the late 90s. And then the year 2000 was really when I did that Merchant Venice. And at that time, I got married as well in, in 2000, um, in September 2000. So that just seemed like another kind of golden age for me um, in my life, you know, when everything seemed to be kind of sunny. And I, I moved down from London. I left London. I moved down to Lewis in East Sussex, where my wife is from. Uh, and I moved in with her into a little flat there. And so that was all r rather amazing, you know, working at this theatre that I'd always sort of dreamed about working in. And now I was there and I really felt like I'd hit a pinnacle. My son was born in 2003. And we, this, so for two years, things continued in this way and the RSC was still being nice to me, giving me lots of great stuff. I was going around the world with them, you know, a tra touring around the world uh, and it was very exciting. Then it began to sort of hit me that I was away from home all the time and my son was growing up fast, you know, and every week I would only see him on a Sunday because I'd be away all week on the tour and I'd come back on the Sunday and it was as though he'd really changed in a week and I'd missed it. And that was beginning to seem wrong to me, you know, that that was the case. And uh, we were living in a, just a one bedroom flat and he was growing up and it was starting to get too small, this flat for us, you know, it was sort of almost a bit dangerous really. So I felt that something had to change again. And that was when um, I saw an advertisement in the paper for a job as a lecturer, uh, an act, an, a lecturer in acting uh, in a university called the University of Central Lancashire, which is in Preston absolutely miles away <laughs> and I thought well I'll just go for it and see because I'd be sort of curious to see if actually they even give me an interview you know or whether I'm just not that sort of person at all in their eyes 
But they did give me the interview and then they offered me the job. And so we had this conversation, me and my family, where I said, I think I, I think this job has happened and we'll get some security for a change and I'll be at home, you know, but we've got to move. And I sort of said, it won't be forever. It'll only be for a couple of years and then we'll come back down. I'll find a job back down here, you know, but it'll be a start, a kind of new start. Uh, that was in 2007. And what had just happened, of course, was Northern Rock had collapsed and all, that whole thing was happening. So there was this feeling in the air that, you know, you had to get hold of something, um, yeah, that you could rely on. So I, it was also that was also got spinning around in my head is actually I've got to pay the bills here. So I did. And we moved up to to uh, a little town called Clitheroe in East Lancashire, which is a rural town. Uh, and I stayed there for longer than I thought I would. <laughs> stayed there till 2014 and worked my way up to senior lecturer. We had this little team, the, only, a, only a few of us running the acting department uh, at uh, this university. But it was, it was great and they were a really fabulous team. The guy who runs the place was just absolutely amazing guy, uh, Terence, and uh, he's a good friend now, you know. Mm. Um, just a really, really clever, clever guy. And I learned how to teach sort of acting. There. I mean, I'd done bits of teaching before. And one of the things that I had done during my acting career was to learn how to teach English as a foreign language, um, just as a backup plan. Um, and I did use it. You know, I worked in Brighton. I worked in London sometimes teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, so I'd learned how to teach sort of through, I mean, that's like a boot camp when you do that. You know, when you learn to teach English as foreign it's like doing boot camp. You, 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 couple of months, you know, and you, they just chuck you in the deep end. They chuck you in front of people who can't speak English and say, go on then, swim. And then they tell you what you did wrong the next day and you go again in the afternoon, you go again. It's a fantastic way to learn how to teach, right? <laughs> I don't know about the students. They're sitting there bewildered, you know, by the <laughs> face. But, yeah. uh... <laughs> it's almost like when the... When the PhD students get asked to lecture to undergrads on, you know, their tutorials right, and things, right? And they're okay. thrown in front yeah. of us, and we're like, but "You don't have to learn fast, right? Yes, you learn yeah, fast. Right. You know, yeah. like, note to self: never say that again. You know, never do that again. Never do that. You know, you you learn by eliminating what simply never work will never work. Uh, anyway, uh, so I've got you know, and I've done some bits of sort of stepping in for people, doing little bits and pieces for them. But then this was a full time thing and uh, it was great. I got to teach act, you know, young people from the north, many of them from the northwest. Many of them were coming into the room with a sort of, you know, from a state like ha council state in Salford, you know, and I, I could sort of relate to that a bit, actually. You know, I thought, yeah, I know. Uh, I, I know this, you're carrying some baggage there, you know, and th that's sort of OK. You know, it, it's just what what we can do to to sort of what we can do about that as it mm. were for, what we can do for you there's the old than... there's the old adage of uh if you can see it then you can be it and i, okay. I suppose yeah. you really you really represented that for them because you could relate on such a human level i like to think so i mean I, you know you'd know, have to ask them in a way but I, I you know i think i got on well with them. they were very nice to me when i left you know they were you know uh, they were very they were very complimentary to me uh so i guess i guess they did see that you know i was sort of on their side then i got this job at gsa in in guildford and so we moved back down to lewis well actually we moved, we we live in a village just outside lewis because lewis is just too expensive <laughs> uh and uh and i commute into guildford now um so right. i've been there since uh, uh 2015 beginning of okay. 2015 yeah and um before before we transition to because I, I wanted to ask a, a few questions around your your TEDx talk that you did okay. earlier this year just because I think it's, it's super interesting and more okay. is but but before we before we transition to that there's a couple of things I wanted to ask about uh, just generally speaking your your acting career one of them is I I, I mentioned that you were the, the week before I was born you were on like the exact week before I was born you're on an episode of Chuckle Vision okay. <laughs> Can you remember what to me, the number of things like? and the people I've worked with, the things that I've done in my career? But people always want to know about that one. It's curious. Yeah. To me. I think it's because it's just such a 
classic UK Everyone's childhood, right? You know? Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what was that like? Can you remember? I know I saw you were only I on one. It, episode. Yeah, I do. No, I do remember because it was actually quite a tough job. There, it was a, it was a very fast shoot, so just a couple of days, um, in a in a wood. Uh, and the first day was really hard work, you know, because it was pouring down with rain and mud everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I was clanking around in some medieval suit of armour half the time, you know, I think, or some, you know, the whole thing was just uh, um, just really gruelling. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think I got a little bit angry about the whole thing and a bit sort of stupid. And the producer, who was really good, had to have words with me, you know, and say, you know, what's the matter with you? You know, you look so sour faced. And I next day I came in with a smile on my face and I thought, he's right, of course he's right. Don't be silly. Come on, you know. And uh, so I ended up having a nice time on it. Oh, <laughs> uh, and they were great, the two of them, you know, they were just, they just kept themselves to themselves, you know. Uh, uh, they didn't make a fuss about anything. They'd learned not to bother fussing, just to get on and do it. And I think they were happy that they had a show of their own and they were doing their numbers their routines and you know these to actors me, to you. In, these actors would come and go yes yeah very true <laughs> oh fantastic yeah. they, were, they were charming you know the pair of them they were perfectly fine mm -hmm. mm. it's almost like a pinch me moment for me that you know <laughs> with with, with uh... So the networks that we find ourselves in in life, you know, I, I grew up watching that and then I'm one person away from someone who's active with those people, right? <laughs> and th th there's, it's just kind of, I can dismiss it casually, but that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do understand. It was an important part of lots of people's childhood and I didn't know that until I went up to Preston and they used to say, oh my God, you were in childhood, you know. Like, oh, yes. Why yeah. do you care? Like, no, 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 no. This was my childhood, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I, I see, I see. Yeah, gosh, I had no idea. I mean, one does these things and it's only later one realises wow so i did that thing and those people were part of that and at the time it just felt like i'm just doing another job or something mm -hmm. later you realize you were there when something quite extraordinary was happening yeah because so, i suppose you're it, just doing going on yeah you don't project know what to project to project yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. You're, you don't know how it's going to be seen in years to come you know um, right. and, and speaking of various like different projects and things you were doing uh, hmm. what what's one film or role or a production that you would have liked to have done that you never managed to 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 do oh, God. There... i mean there were, there were a number that i went up for that i failed to get but there was one i think where i i just kicked myself because i know i got very very close and it would have made me a household name which was a series that rowan atkinson was in uh, a, a sitcom called the thin blue line um which was about the police because it was a vehicle for rowan atkinson it was peak time stuff. Uh, and I went up for one of the regular police characters on that. Uh, and Ben Elton wrote it. So I met Ben Elton and we went through, you know, and I, I read for it and everything. And we were in the room, Ben Elton, uh, who I actually met one or two times. Um, and I did one of his plays uh, once as well. Uh, and he came to the read through and was very nice. And um, he, he, I just remember him sort of smiling and going, and he said, you know, you've got a lot of comedy in you. Uh, and I thought, wow, Ben Elton just told me I have a lot of comedy in me. You know, <laughs> uh, does it get better? Uh, and um, and then he said, and if it doesn't work out, it's because you're, you're not quite, you don't look quite right for the age of the character. And I thought that's his way of telling me no, uh, yeah, politely, yeah. sort of nicely letting me down. And uh, sure enough, it was a very successful series. And that particular actor went on to become very famous. So I think that was one of the ones where I thought, ah, if only, that would have been astonishing to have been part of that. Along with that, rough comes with smooth, you know, a along with that comes trade-offs. And one of those trade-offs is you can't buy a pint of milk in Tesco's, you know, without somebody coming up to you and harassing you. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. I don't know yeah. if I would have liked that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think... This is completely off piece and not not really relevant to. But is the show that you just referred to? I think there was a piece that Rowan Atkinson did a few years ago on the importance of free speech and jokes mm. not being restricted yeah. for for you know political correctness. And I think he shared something to do with they they created this absurd character who arrested someone for 
walking in the cracks on the pavement and walking all over the place or something. That 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 sounds like it should have been something out <laughs> of that show that you've just mentioned. Maybe it was. Yeah. I yeah. don't remember that that. I remember Rowan Atkinson was I remember that moment when Rowan Atkinson made made statements about free speech. Yes. Yeah, it's probably that. like five years ago or something. But... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean he's trying to defend comedy, you know, and the the issue with comedy is what is uh, you know wh- where is the red line you know and is there one and should there be one comedy can be a volatile thing right mm. what do you think the the line is or with acting how far can you take things in your opinion do you mean with comedy or yes yeah it's something i'm um, interested well in. i'm not an expert i'm not a stand-up comedian i tried it but i didn't like it i stopped uh, i would say in print uh, in theory i think anything is up for grabs in theory I think it's easy to say that, you know. <laughs> uh, and if I was on the receiving end of some vicious comedy, I'm not sure how I would feel about it. But I sort of think that's if you want to live in a li- liberal democracy, maybe that's the price that you kind of have to pay. But I'm not an expert on it. So, sure. You know, sure. Um, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate being on, on the spot there. Um, no, it's all right. It's all right. So, so yeah, and then you you turn you you explain that yourself moved back south and then commuting into yeah. GSA and working yeah. there as a professor. Uh, what's the biggest well, kind I'm of senior lecturer there? Sure. Senior yeah. lecturer. Sorry, I, I'm not getting my terms right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as a senior lecturer, how did that compare most significantly with what it was like to be an actor in terms of your day to day routines and how you how you were as a person? Oh, I feel like I'm a different person really I, I, you know my my whole attention is is on a different thing altogether um i spend a, funny enough i spend a lot more time now as a teacher thinking at a sort of meta level about acting than i ever did when i was an actor when i was an actor i was thinking about the role the character the situation the lines the practical stuff i didn't spend a lot of time going hmm what is acting yeah. <laughs> Now I seem to spend an awful lot of my time pondering about why we bother doing this in the first place and what is it all about, you know, uh, having these conversations with, you know, other members of staff or you know, reading books about it, and engaging with it at a meta level, which, you know, is fine, uh, and, and writing about it at that level as well. Uh, so, But it's a different, it's like, a, you're, it's like being a different person, really. I, my, my attention is, is on completely other things from, you know, from the moment I wake up in the morning. I'm thinking about, well, I've got a bunch of people that I must... And some people would say, well, look, when you're teaching, you're performing. It's a kind of performing. Yes, OK. And in a way, I write my lines in my lesson plan and it's sort of a performance. But I don't think of myself as a performer when I start. You know, I'm thinking about the content of what I have to deliver and whether it's communicating to them and what they are responding with and you know it's it's about them really you know and if it's not working then I have to change it I have to go back to the drawing board and go I need to find another way of communicating this but it's about the students not about me and my fancy performance you know it's about their fancy performance so it's a bit closer to being a director at times and sometimes I wear both of those hats. You know, I might flip during the course of one class. I go, right, I'm going to put, and I'll say this to the students, I'll put my director's hat on now. I'm going to direct you a bit, you know, and sort of demonstrate a relationship that you might have with a director, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a bit more like that than it is like being an actor, because when you're being an actor, you're going, please look at me, right? And being a teacher, it's it's not, please look at me. It's, I'm looking at you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, understood. Yeah, it make, makes perfect sense. And so now we kind of turn to this year. And what I wanted to, to, to touch on on this podcast was the subjects you covered in your, your TEDx talk, which I found particularly interesting around right. how actors gain trust. Why is okay. this important? Well, it's important for actors to gain trust with the audience. Uh, and it's something that happens at a more implicit or subconscious, under the radar sort of level. You don't declare that that's what you're doing, but you try to establish a feeling that the audience has that you are trustworthy. And it's important, you know when it's important, when it fails. It's important because when it isn't there, you can't, it's incredibly difficult to recover from that problem. 
um, it's very, very difficult to get the show back, as it were, if the audience suddenly has this funny feeling that you don't know what you're doing. And that can be communicated in all sorts of subtle ways, as well as big, obvious ways. In the TEDx talk, I was talking about things that are kind of quite big and obvious. You know, like you bump into some furniture, as it were, or you break something or you... But the force with which you do things with your body, the amount of force with which you apply yourself to the actions that you are taking, um, it reads that we know, you know, we have this sort of folk physics, folk biology understanding. We have an intuitive understanding of gravity and force. You know, we, we don't need to be taught it. We know it, you know, intuitively from, from very, very early. Little babies understand that things fall, start to understand that things fall down and things have weight, they have force. We don't need to explain those things to them. Um, right, it's just built into a, our mental wiring. So we're very, very good at noticing when there's a mismatch. You know, when somebody applies force to something it's too much, even if it's only a bit too much or not enough. And that application of force, as it were, is a signal to us. It tells us something about the other person. You know, it tells us about their mood, their attitude, or or what whether we should be a, a f feel potentially threatened by them. Um, if a person walks into a train carriage, you know, and kind of chucks themselves around and sl slams down into a seat, you you avoid this person. You go, there's something up here, you know. Uh, and even if they don't do it as much as that, you'll still get a vibe off this person. We get, we get vibes. We're very good at getting vibes off people, I think, on the whole, human beings. Mm, and I, we, we're very good at it, you know. And so even at a distance of a stage, an audience can pick up a vibe from somebody like, that doesn't, you know, they don't look quite happy. <laughs> and you can hear it in the feet as well on the stage. If people are kind of banging on the stage with their feet, Um you know, because they've got legs like tree trunks that are really stiff and they're banging their weight, all their mass, their mass is going down into the floor. You can sort of see it, you can sort of hear it, and it's a slightly uncomfortable feeling that you will get from this performer. The performer, I often get this from, from performers in training, they go, yes, yes, but what if I'm playing a character who is, you know, really sort of heavy or... And I go, yes, I know, it's an interesting paradox which you're going to have to learn how to solve. That's the only answer I can give. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I actually sort of don't have an answer to that. You know, you have to somehow make me think you're doing it on purpose. You know what you're doing. You're, it's nothing to be worried about. It's the character. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and there are lines, there are fuzzy areas, you know, and I don't deny that, particularly with film. Um, there, there can can be fuzzy areas with film performances where certain actors might push the boundaries of this and you go gosh that's really believable but hey they're on a screen we're not in the space that they are in so we're safe so we always feel safe because they're not going to come out of the box and hurt us so it's less serious if but even then we might still wince a bit or we might kind of go oh gosh even then even though they're not actually in front of us physically. Do, do, do you get my meaning? And, and yeah. so sometimes actors will, you know, do, do things that are kind of dangerous or whatever, or phys physically very, very impactful on a screen. And we go, gosh, that's incredibly believable. But if you transfer that across, you're making a mistake. Um, because in a live situation, the audience is ready <laughs> for a different kind of thing to happen. You know, they, they'll, their alarm signal will go off more uh, vividly. You know, their threat alarm signal. Um, that's what I believe. And, uh, uh, you know, I, had lots of, I have lots of anecdotal experiences to back that up, um, where I've made mistakes or other people have made mistakes and too much force has been applied or this or that. And you can feel the audience go... <sighs> and you think, oh, God, I've lost the audience. <laughs> How do we get them back? Mm, uh, the thing that I find particularly interesting is because it's so 
under the spotlight literally on the stage yeah. It, yeah. It, it's easy to pick up that intuitive That's trust true. relationship and and the funny thing is all i'm thinking of there when you're describing that is when you were playing the lion in wizard of oz and how potentially that might have uh yeah i, I think lost it the, the trust yeah. of, of, pe of yeah. people watching and what's he so angry about you know <laughs> yeah yeah the poor lion with no heart he's just yeah well, no, yeah, is, is it, but actually, if you watch Bert Lahr, uh, the guy who plays the the lion in the film of The Wizard of Oz, yeah. he's so delicate and gentle in the way that he does it, you know, and it's incredibly warm and appealing to the audience. As a result, he wins the film. He wins, you know, uh, he wins our hearts, and it's not just about winning our hearts. You know, you can you can play an evil person, right? But you still have to have that quality of, don't worry. You know, it's we're playing. It's acting. We're playing. It's a yeah, fiction, yeah, fantasy. Yeah. And I also think, in the way that, because it's because it's under the spotlight, and you're able to observe these things, mm. it obviously puts it under the lens. But also, so, yeah. that means you understand it and can almost apply that in non-acting world with how you conduct yourself in like interpersonal dynamics, work relationships, on a date, for example, like the, all those scenarios that an individual <laughs> find themselves in. Is, yeah. I yeah. suppose the, the lessons of moving with self-possession and being smooth with your body language yeah. invites people to trust you yeah. at, at large as well, right? So yeah. I, that, that's really what I took away from it. Yeah. And also, I think it's um, it's a status thing as well. I think you raise your status in the eyes of the other person if you act with self-regulation. Um you know, if you s seem like you're out of control of your emotions, then generally speaking, I think people will see you. They, they, they will drop drop your status. Mm. Uh, Almost like I a mean, subconscious there are, thing. There are exceptional cases, you might say, that, you know, where people say, for example, people talk about things like mad dog syndrome, you know, where authoritarian personalities will be very unpredictable and wild in their behaviour. And so everybody is tap dancing around them all the time, kind of wondering what the hell they're going to do next and being scared of their next move. But hey, and you know, when one one thinks of Donald Trump and his his outbursts of rage, you know, uh, over the last couple of days, apparently, according to the media, I, who knows? But that's apparently the case, right? And uh, yeah, that that sort of, I guess, that is true. But hey, look what's happening to him. You know, he's losing status. Is he not? You know, he, yes. People are going. People are pulling the plug on him now. Going. Actually, we don't know if we want this guy around much longer now. And there's this other guy in Florida who looks like he's got self possession. Absolutely. <laughs> in his body language, you know, whatever you think of his politics, that's that's by the by. Actually, you know, what I'm looking at is how he behaves in front of the crowd, you know, and the way that he looks like he's so in control of himself, and right that uh, he doesn't do mad dog. You know, maybe he does it backstage in the office but he doesn't do it in front of the crowd um, and he has status as a result and know? trust and, and and trust in politics and is something so, so rare in florida you know he wiped the floor with the with the opposition in florida mm -hmm. i mean if there's one thing we can say for sure that's happened in that election it's that that man has come out well in the eyes of the voters of yes. florida you yeah. know yeah. Yeah. whatever we think of him like is he a crazy right wing whatever whatever we think of that you know is is beside the point as far as i'm concerned it's his it's his behavior that i look at and i go i'm not that surprised to find that people are putting a tick next to a cross next to your name uh, with that he he's, he comes across in that way so I, I do think there's a status thing as well and i've always thought that uh, ever since i started thinking about it it started when i was asked to write a book about shakespeare um, and so I looked into the history of rhetoric because rhetoric was the thing that they did instead of drama school. <laughs> they, you know, so Shakespeare went to grammar school. He went to King Edward Grammar School, we think. And he learned rhetoric um, at grammar school. He learned it not just as a literary thing where, you know, there would be these Latin texts or whatever that you had to pass and you know, figure out what the rhetorical tropes were in it and all of that. But also part of that training was what they called pronunciation, which meant stand up and deliver it in class, in, you know, in front of the teacher. And you go through those old... So I went through the rhetorical manuals and read, read them, and I went back and had a look at the, the old classical models like Cicero 
and um, Quintilian and some uh, and a, a book called Ad Herenium, which were manuals of, of, of rhetoric. In other words, how to do public speaking and how to come across well, you know, uh, and win the hearts and minds of your audience. Uh, if you were an orator, a politician or a lawyer or something, it was a huge, huge thing. You know, it was a huge subject, huge, of huge importance to them. And so I look through them and I go, where's the signs? About, where do they talk about the performing bit? Uh, you know, and I would go find it and look at it. And they frequently would use these words like um, words for decorum and, and grace. And Cicero did this and they all did it, you know, um, decere. And, and, the and so, suddenly we find we find there's this discourse, you know, of high status people acting with self-regulation in their behavior. Mm. You know, that, um, that to me speaks exactly to, I don't know if you've come across, there's a clinical psychologist in from Canada called Jordan Peterson. I um, do know, I do but, know about that. But his, his, the, first chapter, <laughs> the first chapter of his 12 Rules for Life is um, stand up straight with your shoulders back. And it's right, refer okay. <laughs> reference to the way that, uh, I think it's Trump's lobsters right. basically regulate their, their their position in the dominance hierarchy within lobsters okay. <laughs> as the, the bigger and more stronger. And then they like measure the serotonin decreasing when they lose right. a fight and they kind of hunch over physically. Okay. And that, that serotonin is the exact same thing that humans have somewhere in, in our brain right. to regulate your own place. Well, so maybe I, I, there's I, a... I wouldn't like to take on uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, uh, <laughs> he's got too many fans. Uh, but um, I think the uh, certainly something that I say to my students, you know, I talk about, how you stand and how you how you these are a kind of openness in your mm. body you know a kind of i'm not wearing any armor look uh and where they find that that physical confidence where does it come from you know what what do you associate it with subconsciously mm -hmm. um in terms of your posture and in terms of your movement very 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 interesting out of curiosity if someone listening or watching to this is potentially wants to work on their confidence or trust what, what, what would you what would you prescribe what do you recommend they try and do um <clears throat> pilates. pilates pilates yeah okay uh you know joseph pilates uh, the, there's a whole sort of system of train of body body conditioning uh called pilates and the fundamental idea behind it is that you have a core stability um in your center just below your belly button um, and you get hold of this, you know, and this was something I was talking about in the TEDx, that you you basically sort of, I mean, to put it crudely, you're kind of sucking in your stomach a little bit towards your spine. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm crude, I'm making it very crude, putting it like that, you know, and some Pilates teachers would go, oh, no, 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 you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you just hold on to that part of your body and it just stabilizes your upper body, you know, it, because these muscles are sort of wrapping around your lumbar vertebrae. And, the, you know, there's a number of muscles around there that are kind of just holding you nice and solid at the bottom of your spine. Um, so you're defying gravity as well with them. You're resisting the force of gravity that wants to make you into a little ball, you know. Um, and uh, so and Pilates is a fantastic um, system for make making you move always with that core stability functioning uh, activated and functioning um so it has great value i think as a system and, and then using that almost because once you do that you begin to psychologically build up that little bit of confidence and then hopefully yeah, that positive yeah. reinforcement if your spine is wobbling about because it's not on on a solid support you feel wobbly in other ways right okay. yes you know. great advice uh, I'll try and implement that next time I'm hosting an event or something. <laughs> um, okay, so turning to kind of more more general questions about yourself then, what have you been most proud of in your career? Well, is that acting, anything in acting, or or is it, would it be more lecturing now? Uh, well, that's a good question insofar as I don't think I can say there's one thing that would cross over both. You know, they, they do feel like very different activities and different selves, if you like that, that uh, with that. So I'm not sure in acting, what am I most proud of? I think I'm just most proud of some of the things that happened at the RSC that uh, where I felt like I was sort of at my peak, 
in some ways, uh, doing that much in Venice, you know, and, and getting rounds of applause from the audience for being funny was, was a thrill. And, and particularly being able to do that in other countries. I mean, there was one occasion where we were in Japan and we were performing in, in a theater in Tokyo. And I was very worried about it because of, there's, because the cultural difference meant that I did not know whether anything would be funny with the Japanese audience. And I did my number, you know, my 10 minute number that I had, and it was very silent. <laughs> I went off stage going, well, there you go. <laughs> Can't win them all, you know. And uh, and then I went to this market, this place called Asaksa, where there was this big market. And uh, I was with my, um, my wife and he said, oh, uh, let's go to the tourist office, you know, and sort of get, get a handle on what this area is. Um, we went in there and there was a man at the counter and he just started staring at me. And I, I said, is everything OK? You know, sorry, have I done something I shouldn't have, you know, have I done something culturally embarrassing? And uh, <laughs> and uh, he went, oh, you, you, Merchant of Venice, like this. And, uh, <laughs> and I went, uh, yes, 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 that was me. Yes. Very funny, very, very funny, very funny, like this. <laughs> I thought, wow, that really means something to me. I, I was like, wow, wow, thank you so much. Wow. You know, <laughs> in Japan, I was funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, at least to him, right? Uh, so, uh, so I was sort of very proud of that level of work that we were doing there as an actor, I think. Um, and there was a sort of one year in my life where I was commissioned to write three things you know and I was paid to write them and it felt like that my whole writing side of my my world was uh, was really taking off and I, we did some amazing things that that was an important year for me these big big stuff that I'd written as a teacher I don't know um I I, I think I think I'm still on that journey actually Zach I don't, I don't think we've arrived there yet I had a good week this week with two classes um it was the same class I delivered twice but I tweaked the second one having learned from the first one. But both classes with my MA actors seemed to go down really well. Uh, and at the end they went, that was, you know, we were really pleased that we had that class. And I kind of felt quite thrilled because when I left the room, I thought, I've just given you something that meant a huge amount to me, you know. And if you didn't like it, if you hadn't thought there was any, any value in it, I think I would have been really frustrated and disappointed by that in myself. Mm -hmm. um, that I hadn't got the message across, but I obviously did, you know. And so this week, I feel like I kind of achieved something that I was oh, very proud fantastic. of. No, yeah. pl pl pleased to hear it. And what are your, I suppose it leads quite nicely onto what, what do you hope to try and impart with your students now? What are your aims for the rest of your kind of lecturing time? What's the... um, uh, what sort of time zone are you in now? What sort of time frame are you in? I don't know. This year? How, this... However you'd interpret it, to be honest. <laughs> um, well, I've started this new programme. I'm programme leader since September of this MA acting programme. So um, I've taken this on with my colleague, Gronje, who's running the MFA side of it. And it's a lot of it is new. Uh, you know, a lot of it's coming at me rapidly. I'm thinking, gosh, all of these new people management things I'm having to deal with, this, that, da, 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 da. So my immediate aim is to get to the end of the year without dying. <laughs> um, and that okay. the people who have been on this first year with me, these students, you know, actually get something out of it, feel like it was worth it, that their fees were not wasted. And maybe they'll go on to be good, good, really sort of really good ambassadors for GSA, you know, out in the world, uh, which is why I, I, it's important to me that they are good ambassadors for us um, and that they, they have careers and they come back in five years time, you know, and go, thanks, because I'm now in this amazing Netflix series, you know, and I'll never forget that class we had. And when people say things like that, you go, oh, I did appear to have made a difference after all, you know. It's that feedback loop that you had with the sociologists when you thought back right. to the influence they had on you. So. Right. Yeah. You realise, because, because it mattered to you, you realise that it's possible to matter to others if you get it right, you know. Oh, what a fantastic message to 
to wrap up with. Um, well, thank you very much, Zach. I really enjoyed uh, telling you all about my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. I think it's it's so interesting, and I'm not too heavily invested myself in going to seeing acting and theatre. However, like last year, I really got back into it because I fell into a couple of groups. Went went to right. see like I can't remember now. Dear Evan Hansen. I don't know if you've you've heard of that. Mm. Um, I have a growing appreciation for it, and I feel Good. very privileged to be able to. Uh, Awesome. Give this space to unravel, and I've learned a lot. I hope all the listeners well, have as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. See you later. <laughs>